Hello students, welcome to the amazing platform of Physics Wala. Welcome to the PW English channel, my dear students. We are on the lecture 2 of Solid State. I hope all of you have understood everything in the first lecture. First lecture was super easy and it was all theoretical. I tried making you explain each and every point so that you will remember it for life, right? Yes. So now my dear students, today we are on the lecture 2. What are we going to discuss? We have discussed the different types of solids amorphous solid and crystalline solids and also we also know from here that your amorphous solids are just 1% of the all solids present. 99% of your solids are crystalline solids and that is the most important reason for us to discuss crystalline solids in detail. After that we started discussing about the crystalline solids and we classified the crystalline solids in four major solids. First was ionic, then it was uh, molecular solids and then metallic solids and then covalent solids. We will be discussing each and every type of solid today. We have discussed ionic solid. Today we will continue the further process. Okay, I hope all of you are excited. Let's start the amazing session. So, the second type of solid that we will be discussing is the metallic solid. So, let's try to understand what exactly is a metallic solid. So, my dear students, we all know that what are metals? Elements, those have the tendency to lose electrons. Metals generally have the tendency to lose electrons or we could say that they have a valence electrons that they are ready to lose, right? Yes. So, my dear students, we will understand about the metallic solids. Let's take example of metallic solid. Uh, zinc is an example of metallic solid my dear students. So similarly, let's take sodium. Sodium is also an example of metallic solid. Now I'll explain you what these does. Okay. The second thing is const uh, constituent particles. What are the particles my dear students? They are metals, right? They are elements. Yes, I hope you're clear with this. The uh, constituent can I write it here? Metals. Yeah. Metals are your constituent particles. And what is the force of interaction? The force of interaction is, my dear students, metallic bonding. Can I say the force of interaction is metallic bonding? Yes. So let's say that it is metallic bonding. Now I'll make you explain everything. Now let's try to understand what a what a metallic solid is. Okay. So now my dear students, to understand metallic solid, let's take an example of zinc. Okay. Zinc is a metal. Zinc is a metal. Okay. So ma'am, zinc is a metal and zinc has a very high tendency. Since it is a metal, it has a tendency to lose electrons. So what does zinc do? Zinc loses two electrons, right? Yes. Let's say electron is here and electron is here. There you will have another zinc which will again lose two electrons. You will have electron here somewhere, electron here. Let's say you have zinc two plus here and it will lose electrons somewhere here somewhere here so basically what happens is your metals your metals lose electrons and they are present in the sea of electrons those electrons don't have a definite place to be present they are present randomly in a particular surface so you have zn2 plus and you have the sea of electrons around it okay you have various zn2 pluses and you have electrons present around it this is how a metallic solid exists okay and then there is an interaction between these electrons, these electrons and this is what is known as the metallic bonding. Okay. So now let's try to understand the metallic bonding a little more. Okay. So if you see these positively charged ions present in the sea of electron, they are also known by a name which is known as kernel. So you need to write this down. Positively charged ions present in C of electron are known as kernels. This is the line which you will come across if 
by any chance if by any chance you if by any chance you read the ncrt which i have told you that you have to read but i'm sure you haven't read that till now okay yeah so if you by chance read the ncrt you will come across this line that positively charged ions present in the sea of electrons are known as kernels these are kernels and this is how metallic bonding takes place this is how metallic bonding takes place okay i hope you're clear with the concept that what is metallic bonding and what are the kernels how do we define kernels yes perfect now let's move a little further first if you want to write it you can write it down and then we'll move further okay write it down my dear students Okay, I hope you've written it. Now let's move forward. Now let's move forward, my dear students. Now the first point says that the first point says that the melting point is fairly high, but it is comparatively less than the ionic solids. I told you that ionic bonding is the most strongest bonding. Ionic bonding is strongest. If yes, covalent bonding is the strongest. Then you have ionic, and then you have metallic bonding, my dear students. So the bonding here, I can write that ionic bonding is a little bit stronger than the metallic bonding. and that is the reason and that is the reason the melting point is high yes metallic bonding your metallic bonding in your metallic bonding yes the melting point is high but it is comparatively lesser than the ionic bonding because ionic bonds are even stronger than the metallic bonds okay yes perfect so i hope you're clear with this point second unlike the ionic solids they are malleable and ductile now let's try to understand what is malleable and what is ductile okay what is malleable write it down tendency to get converted into sheets the tendency to get converted into sheets is known as malleability right yes so so malleability is the tendency to get converted into sheets and what is ductility what is ductile nature tendency to get converted into wires tendency to get converted into wires is actually known as the ductile nature okay so what does it say it says that your metals your metals have the tendency to get converted into sheets as well as they can be converted into wires okay so now let me explain you why does this happen okay if you see my dear students you have zn2 plus present in the sea of electrons electrons don't have a definite position to be present okay so what happens is you have your uh, metal you have your metal ions if you try to convert them into sheets you apply pressure from both the sides what will happen uh, since the position of your electrons is not fixed they can move around yeah they'll move around my dear students and they can be converted into sheets there will be nothing known as repulsion because the position is not fixed right yes so they'll move a little here and there and you will get the sheets right yes so they can be converted into sheets similarly they can also be converted into wires right because the position is not fixed okay so so we can say that so we can say that unlike the ionic solids they are malleable and ductile ionic solids were not malleable and ductile but your but your uh, metallic solids are malleable as well as ductile okay i hope it is clear perfect my dear students this point is important all these points are important questions are asked from these particular points next when potential difference is applied the mobile electrons can move making the metallic solid a good conductor now see i told you i told you for a metal or a element to be a good conductor of electricity it should have good charge carriers and what are charge carriers uh, either they could be uh, Uh, free electrons or they could be free ions right yes now now uh, it is saying that your metallic solids are good conductors why are they good conductors because you can see that you have free electrons present 
they don't have a fixed position they are free yes ma'am since they have a free electrons present they can carry the charge and they are good conductors of electricity okay yes so this is the basic uh, thing here when potential difference is applied the mobile electrons can move making the metallic solid a good conductor okay so it is a good conductor this is very important my dear students please please write it down and then we'll move forward okay okay i hope you've written it i hope you've written it pause the video and then you had to write i'm not going to give you time because it will take a lot of time again okay so now my dear students that was all about metallic solids that was all about metallic solids now we will be discussing about the molecular solids okay now but ionic solids had very strong interactions ionic interactions then we talked about metallic solids metallic solids also had a good interaction okay so now we will be talking about wonder molecular solids okay what are molecular solids molecular solids what will be their constituent particles my dear students since i am talking about molecular solids then definitely their constituent particles would be molecules yeah perfect now let's talk about the force of interaction what will be the force of interaction in molecular solids you generally have a van der waals forces of interactions you have van der waals forces of interaction i'll make you explain don't worry but you have studied all these in the chemical bonding chapter so here the force of attraction would be van der waals interaction okay uh hydrogen bonding dipole dipole interaction and van der waals of uh, london forces london forces right i'll i'll make you explain don't worry i'll make you explain i know though you were supposed to know all of the interactions because you have studied in chemical bonding but i know all of you so i'll also make you explain each and every interaction one by one okay for the time being you can write it and then we'll move forward okay i hope you've written it now my dear students now let's talk about each and every three i i told you molecular solids could exist in three major types it could be non polar molecular solids polar molecular solids and hydrogen bonding molecular solids now now we'll discuss each and every one in detail okay so the first is non polar molecular solids to understand this we actually need examples so let's take a few examples okay so if i talk about non polar molecular solid then the examples would be you need non polar molecular solids so you will have co2 you will have so3 uh etc yeah these types of solids now like i'll explain you why are they non polar okay if you talk about co2 you have carbon here you have double bond over here double bond over here i hope all of you remember how to calculate the dipole moment since oxygen is more electronegative so the dipole moment would be this direction since oxygen is more electronegative this this will cancel out and your net dipole moment will come out to be zero net dipole moment will come out to be zero right yes similarly your so3 is also symmetrical molecule and that is the reason it is non polar in nature so so the elements which are symmetrical in shape they will be non polar uh, non polar uh, non polar molecular solids okay now let's talk about now let's talk about the dipole moment since they are non polar ma'am what will be the dipole moment zero so can i say that the dipole moment here would be equal to zero yeah perfect let's move forward next is force of attraction now what will be the force of attractions now my dear students since they are non polar in nature they will have the weakest forces of interaction and the weakest forces of interaction that exist in non polar molecules are london forces it is a type of van der waal force my dear students it is the weakest force which is present in the non polar molecules okay so the force of interaction would be london forces this is the weakest force of interaction okay 
yes perfect now let's talk about melting point since since there is a very weak force of interaction between the molecules i can say that i can say that it is the weakest so the melting point will also not be very high you don't need a very high temperature for for breaking the very strong very weak interactions right yes so it will have a fairly low melting point so can i say that it has a low melting point yes so it has low melting point okay let's talk about the last part which is hardness now my dear students if you talk about the solid you can see that the interactions are very weak weak london forces are present so it cannot be a hard solid it will be a soft solid okay so we'll say that it is a soft solid so it is a soft solid okay this is what we need to know about non polar molecular solids okay please write it down and then we'll move forward i hope you've written it now let's move forward now let's talk about the polar molecular solid now we'll be we'll talk about the polar molecular solid so now my dear students when we talk about polar molecular solids first pause the video try yourself and then i'll definitely explain you why am i here i have to explain you right yes first try yourself if i talk about polar molecular solids then i need i know that the molecules will be polar in nature the molecules will be polar in nature example my dear students hcl so2 etc all these are polar in nature i'll just make you explain how they are polar in nature you have hydrogen and you have chlorine which of the following is more electronegative in nature obviously chlorine is more electronegative so you will have something like this okay yes so you can see that there is a dipole moment uh, shown here so it is a polar molecule okay since there is a dipole moment present here so what will be the dipole moment it cannot be equal to zero so we can say that the dipole moment is not equal to zero and that is the reason we are saying it to be a polar molecule okay the next question is asked is okay fine it is a non polar molecule it is a polar molecule now tell us what is the forces of interaction now my dear students since you see that you have hcl that is a dipole is involved so here the interactions are dipole dipole interactions here the interactions are dipole dipole interactions which are stronger than the london forces which are stronger than the london forces so can i say that the interaction here is dipole dipole interaction so the interaction here is dipole dipole interaction okay perfect now let's talk about the melting point so my dear students if you talk about the melting point then what can we say melting point obviously ma'am it will have a high melting point as compared to the non polar molecules because the interaction dipole dipole is stronger than the london forces i told you i had given you that order of the interactions that you need to remember now but still it will have very low melting point these forces are also not very strong forces of interaction so we'll say that it has fairly high melting point no let's say uh, it it still will have low melting point but more than non polar molecular solids okay perfect i hope you are clear with this now let's talk about the hardness still my dear students since the interactions are not very strong so these are also considered as soft solids so we'll say these are soft solids okay so these are soft solids okay perfect i hope you are clear with this please write it down and then we'll move forward can i have water till then i'll have water and then we'll move forward okay okay let's move forward next type of solid which is hydrogen bonded molecular solid okay 
now what is hydrogen bonding that is something which you need to understand see my dear students hydrogen bonding is only and only possible if your hydrogen is connected with some electronegative element out of nitrogen uh, oxygen and fluorine okay nitrogen oxygen and fluorine hydrogen bonded with these three electronegative elements forms hydrogen bonding let's take an example let us say that i had h2 O. Okay, so you had oxygen here, you had hydrogen here, you had hydrogen here. Now, you know that hydrogen is bonded to a very electronegative element which is your oxygen. Okay, so it will have partial negative charge, it will have partial positive charge. Again, you have, you have oxygen here, you have hydrogen here, you have hydrogen here, you will obviously have a lot of uh, water molecules okay so i can say that i can say that here partial negative charge partial positive charge now see hydrogen bonding is always between a hydrogen bonded to a electronegative element okay so this is partial positive this is partial negative so they will have some interaction and this is known as your hydrogen bonding so hydrogen bonding is only possible hydrogen bonding is only possible when your hydrogen is bonded to these three electronegative elements okay and this is how hydrogen bonding takes place and hydrogen bonding is a little stronger than the dipole dipole interactions okay this also i told you in the order i gave okay so let's take example example is h2o nh3 etc okay yeah let's talk about the forces of interaction you know that the force of interaction would be hydrogen bonding okay so can i say that it would be hydrogen bonding now let's talk about the melting point since this interaction is even stronger than the ion dipole uh, even stronger than the dipole dipole interaction hydrogen bonding is a stronger bonding okay so we'll say that uh, melting point would be fairly high because the interaction of hydrogen bonding is a little stronger. Okay. Yes. Now what will you comment on the hardness? It will be a hard solid. It will be a hard solid. Okay. Since the interaction is strong. I hope you are clear with this. You can pause the video, write it down and then we will move forward. I hope you are clear with this. Let's move forward my dear students. Now you have covalent solid. Now let's talk. Now let's talk about the covalent solid. Okay. Covalent solids are also known as network solids. There is another name given to them which is co uh, network solids. Is it written here? No. Then you can write it also known as network solids. Now. Let me tell you, this is the hardest solid that we can say. This is the hardest solid or we can say that the covalent solids have the highest melting point. This interaction is the strongest. Now, why is this the strongest? Till now, when we talked about interactions, we only talked about the interactions in space. Let's say you had an ion. Let's say you had another ion and they had some interaction. But were they sharing something? No, they were not, not sharing something. It was only in the space. Everything was happening, right? Yeah. But what actually happens in covalent bonding is there is a sharing of electrons. You have, you have one atom which shares its electron then you have another atom which shares it like its electrons and you get a bond a b where the both of them are sharing their electrons since there is a sharing of electrons and that is the reason this is the strongest interaction because till now the interactions were just in space but here my dear students there is some quantity some sharing happening here and that is the reason it is the strongest bonding okay now let's take example and let me tell you you only need to remember these examples you don't need anything else uh, other than that the examples are silicon you have silicon carbide you have sio2 you have aln uh, you have diamond you have graphite
these are the few examples that you need to remember that you need to remember for covalent solids okay yes i hope you are clear with this first uh, did i give you time to write it down yeah i gave you if uh, try to uh, the covalent bonds are extended throughout the solid structure i'll make you explain that as well <laughs> don't worry i am here i'll make you understand till then try to understand this my dear students i hope you've written it now my dear students now let's understand this particular part that the covalent bonds are extended throughout the solid structure how are they uh, spreaded uh, throughout the solid structure let's take the example of diamond diamond is made of carbon where carbon is tetrahedrally bonded to the other carbons okay so what does this mean let's talk about a uh, diamond can i write here diamond yeah so you have you have carbon present here it is tetrahedrally bonded to four other carbons okay now each carbon in this will be tetrahedrally bonded to other right yes so here you will have carbon you will have carbon here you will have carbon here carbon 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 and you will have carbon here carbon here carbon here and this also goes on okay so this also goes on i hope you are clear with this now what do i want to show you here that my dear students it is a network which keeps on growing keeps on growing and keeps on growing and that is the reason and that is the reason we call it as a network solid it forms a network kind of a network and since here each every bond is formed by the sharing of electrons it is a very strong bond and you know diamond is so, is the hardest hardest we know hardest solid we know in the world diamond is the hardest solid we know in the world it has a melting point around around 4000 degrees celsius this is so high this bonding is so strong you can just have a look here right yes perfect my dear students so you can draw this diagram if you want to and then we'll move forward i hope you've drawn it now let's move forward let's talk about the melting point we'll say that it has very very high melting point so can i say that it has very high melting point okay next is hardness my dear students it is the hardest we know that diamond is the hardest solid we know so we can say that very hard very hard solids okay these are very hard solids let's talk about the electrical conductivity these are poor conductors of electricity because all the electrons are bonded and they are there are no free electrons present so poor conductors okay or you could say non conductors perfect yes pause the video write it down now after all learning everything about the covalent solids graphite came into the picture and graphite said wait a minute if you are trying to understand each and everything i'll make an exception for you i'll behave exceptionally whatever you think i'll behave in a very different way and that is what graphite did do you know that graphite is a soft solid it is a soft solid yeah it is graphite i hope you can see here now my dear students graphite is a soft solid first thing since all the covalent solids are hard solids but your graphite is here and it's saying that it is a soft solid the other thing that graphite says that graphite says that i am a soft solid and and i am a good conductor of electricity i am a good conductor also it is a good conductor so it is behaving differently in two manners they were hard solids covalent but graphite is a covalent solid yet it is a soft solid okay it is generally used in lubricants uh, you might have played carom right you use a lubricant you use a powder there so that uh, your uh, 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 those uh, carom you can play carom more easily those uh, what do we call them i have no idea what do we call them but they can slide very easily right yeah that is the reason we use the powder the powder which we use is actually made up of graphite and graphite here my dear students actually acts as a 
as a lubricant okay so ma'am we can say that it is a soft in nature obviously it is soft in nature okay the other thing is it is a good conductor of electricity all the covalent solids are uh, poor conductors or non conductors we would say but graphite is a good conductor now we have to understand why is this happening so now let's try to understand that and that could be understood only and only by seeing the graphite structure so here you have the graphite structure and you will have to understand the structure to have a little more clear picture okay so my dear students in graphite structure what happens is there are layers it in its structure there are different layers formed okay so let's say this is layer a and this is layer b so two layers my dear students this layer and this layer are connected to each other by weak van der waal forces so these interactions between two layers are weak van der waals interaction these are weak van der waals interactions okay now i'll make you understand even a little bit more let's say this is your carbon let's first try to understand that you have a layer a you have a layer b and you have weak interactions in between them so you have these layers and these two layers have weak interactions so they can slide over one another easily because the interactions are not very strong and that is the reason it behaves as a it behaves as a lubricant and that is the reason we call it as soft solid that is the reason we call it as soft solid okay so can i say that it can be used as a lubricant perfect okay now let's try to understand why is it a good conductor of electricity okay for uh, con to conduct electricity you need free electrons you need charge carriers okay so now my dear students what actually happens is you have carbon here it is bonded to three other carbons okay and you know that carbon has four valence electrons so it has one electron free every carbon has one electron free right yes so can i say that though it is covalently bonded but there are free electrons present and since there are free electrons present so they will conduct electricity yes that is the reason graphite acts as a good conductor because it has free electrons present in it so graphite behaves a little bit different from the properties we have studied about covalent solids so we need to know about those okay please write it down and then we'll move forward can i have water again you write it down i'll have water and then we'll move forward yes i hope you've written it now let's move forward now my dear students here are a few questions to test what i told you you actually understood or you were just like okay ma'am fine we are reading it no you have to understand and that is the reason you have to solve the question so try to solve the question the first question says that classify the following solids in different categories based on the nature of the intermolecular forces okay you have sodium sulfate so you have na2so4 then you have copper then you have benzene then you have urea urea formula is nh2 c double bond o nh2 okay i'll write urea here uh then you have ammonia then you have water then you have zinc then you have okay you have zinc sulfide then you have diamond then you have rubidium then you have argon uh silicon carbide okay now let's try to understand each and every one individually okay so now if you have na2so4 my dear students can i say that you have na plus and you have so4 two minus yes since it is two oppositely charged ions so can i say that it is a ionic solid is there any problem with that no it's absolutely right perfect this is how you'll classify it now let's talk about copper my dear students what is copper copper is a metal metallic solid it will be a metallic solid okay next is benzene my dear students benzene is a molecular solid and that too non polar molecular solid okay so i'll say that it is a non polar 
molecular solid okay next is urea now my dear students if you see here urea has a dipole present here so it is a molecular solid but it is a polar molecular solid okay so it is a polar molecular solid okay let's talk about nh3 now nh3 nitrogen is bonded to hydrogen that is hydrogen is bonded to a electronegative element nitrogen so here you will have hydrogen bonding so can i say hydrogen bonded uh, molecular solid it is a hydrogen bonded molecular solid let's talk about the other water again hydrogen is bonded to electronegative oxygen so hydrogen bonded molecular solid yeah let's talk about the others you have zinc sulfide you have zn2 plus and you have sos2 negative so it is a ionic solid okay so this is ionic solid let's talk about diamond what is diamond my dear students ma'am diamond is a covalent solid yes so it is a covalent solid let's talk about rubidium my dear students what is rubidium rubidium is a metal so it will be a metallic solid so it is a metallic solid now what is argon argon is a non polar molecular solid it is non polar in nature it is a molecular solid so it will be a non polar molecular solid what is silicon carbide we just learned a few examples of covalent solids and it was one of them so it is covalent solid right yes so this is how you will classify all the different types of solids i hope you are clear with this please pause the video write it and then we'll move forward i hope you've written it let's move forward let's try another question the question says that solid a is very hard solid a is very hard it is electrical insulator in solid as well as in molten state you have a solid a which is a insulator it is not a conductor of electricity neither in a solid state or liquid state so this is a covalent solid right yes we can find out from this thing that we can say it is a covalent solid right yes and melts at extremely high temperature what type of solid it is it is a covalent solid if it was a bad conductor in solid state and good conductor in liquid state it would have been your ionic solid okay perfect you can pause the video write it down and let's move forward why are ionic solids conducting in the molten state and not in the solid state because in the molten state my dear students you have free ions present and since you have free ions present they can conduct electricity very easily because free ions are charge carriers okay so if you want to write it in your language please write it down i have given you the answer perfect i hope you are clear with this you can write the answer next question next question says that what type of solids are electrical conductors malleable and ductile they are electrical conductors they are malleable and they are ductile which were these these were your metallic solids so your answer would be metallic solids right yes perfect my dear students i hope you are clear with this easy right yes let's move forward classify each of the following solids as ionic metallic molecular it is molecular network covalent or amorphous solid okay so let's try to answer each and every part okay the first is tetra phosphorus decoxide so you have p4o10 it is a symmetrical molecule so can i say that it is a molecular solid it is a molecular solid let me write it as molecular solid okay let's move forward next is ammonium phosphate my dear students you have ammonia and phosphate two different ions so it is a ionic solid so it is a ionic solid silicon carbide it is a covalent solid i2 what is i2 non polar molecular solid so it is a molecular solid right yes perfect let's move forward p4 my dear students what is p4 non polar molecular solid right yes so it is a molecular solid graphite is a covalent solid brass is a 
my dear students brass is actually a alloy so let's leave it right for uh, now when you will study metallurgy you will try to uh, answer it a little bit more don't do this right now okay let's talk about rubidium rubidium is a metallic solid it is a metallic solid okay Lith libr is a ionic solid and if i talk about silicon silicon was a covalent solid right yes so easy if you have studied each and every part very thoroughly you will be able to answer each and every part of it okay yes perfect i hope you are clear with this please pause the video and write all the answers perfect yes okay my dear students till now everything is crystal clear right now let's move forward to the next topic which is which is lattice now we are going to actually start the crystalline solids in detail what actually is a lattice okay let's try to understand a lattice okay now my dear students whenever we construct a building what do we do we use a brick we add one brick then we add another brick three bricks and then then brick on brick on brick and we get the building right here so this whole repeating of your brick is actually called the lattice this whole repeating of your bricks and forming a wall is actually a lattice okay that in total is known as a lattice and if i talk about that one brick what is that known as that is your unit cell you will get all the definitions don't worry for the time being you have to understand what is unit cell the brick is the unit cell since we are repeating the brick and forming a wall what will be that that will be a lattice so lattice is a collection of units of cells right unit cells or a repeating uh, unit cell gives you a lattice okay now lattices can be of different types it could be 1d lattice that is one dimensional lattice so this means that you will have a lattice in one particular axis so your lattice could be something like this in any axis x axis y axis z axis it doesn't matter but it is in one particular axis so it will be a one dimensional lattice let's talk about the two dimensional lattice two dimensional lattice so if we talk about a two dimensional lattice my dear students what will it be ma'am since you are talking about two dimension so it will be in two different axes let's say x and y axis so your lattice would be something like this are we playing a game or what i hope all of you remember i hope you might have played this game because i have played this game a lot something like this so can you see one thing here my dear students in this two dimensional lattice that that this particular square is repeating again and again so this one particular cell will be known as your unit cell and since it is repeating again and again in two dimensions so it will be your two dimensional lattice okay let's talk about the three dimensional lattice now for three dimensional lattice we will need something like this okay i'll just make you understand don't worry when ma'am is here why to fair right see connect these four and repeat it repeat it repeat it repeat it repeat it and repeat it see then repeat these right now connect these I hope you're getting the point. Okay, perfect. Now, if you see this one cube is repeating itself all over again and again. Since it is repeating itself all over again and again, again and again, so I can say that this is my unit cell in the three dimensions. So, a square or a cube or any uh, uh, this. 
any cube or cubic or uh, rhombohedral or anything any unit that is repeating itself in the three dimensional lattice will be known as the unit cell of the three dimensional lattice okay and this whole axis this whole lattice in total will be known as the three dimensional lattice okay so this is the basic idea of the unit cell and the lattices i hope you're clear with this please pause the video you can draw it and then you will see the definitions in the next slide okay perfect let's move forward What is space lattice? It is an imaginary collection of the infinite number of points with a regular and repeating geometry. The geometry should be regular and repeating. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Uh, what is unit cell? The smallest repeating unit of the space lattice. The smallest unit which will get repeated again and again and you get your lattice will be known as your unit cell. Now my dear students, to define a unit cell, we need some cell parameters. How can we say a unit cell is a cube? How can I say a unit cell is a cuboid? How can I say a unit cell is a rhombohedral. It depends on the cell parameters. And now my dear students, it would be very difficult for me if I want to study the whole wall. But what if I study only the smallest part which is repeating again and again that is your brick and then I will get the idea of the complete wall. Yes. So this is what we do in the solid state chapter. We find out the smallest unit. We study that particular unit cell and then we get the idea about the whole lattice. Okay. So now to understand this, we need to have a very clear understanding of the unit cell and for unit cell, we need the cell parameters. So now we'll be discussing about the cell parameters. Cell parameters define the geometry of the unit cell, whether, it's, whether it is a cube, whether it is a rhombohedral or what, right? Yes. The imaginary points are known as lattice points. Now, my dear students, imagine I gave you this unit cell. In this unit cell, the points on this lattice, this point, this point, this point, this point, all these points are the lattice points. All these points are the lattice points. So, all the points on the lattice are known as the lattice points. Okay, perfect. I hope you're clear with this. Pause the video, write it down and then we'll move forward. I hope you've written it. Now let's try to understand the cell parameters. Okay. For understanding the cell parameters, I need to draw a unit cell. So let me draw a unit cell. Okay, let's say this is your unit cell. Now, if we talk about this unit cell, my dear students, let's talk about the axes. Okay, you have, you have x axis, you have y axis and you have z axis here. Okay, these are the axes. So, can I take this particular point and let me, let me tell you the, the edge length along A is known as, X axis is known as A. So, this will be the A edge length. So, A is the edge length, okay, along the X axis. What is Y? Uh, edge length along Y is known as B. Edge length along Y is known as B. So, this is something known as B. And the edge length along Z is known as C. So, the edge length along Z axis is known as C. So, can I say that A is the edge length along X axis. B is the edge length along Y axis. And C is the edge length along z axis okay so the three parameters are the edge lengths a b and c after that after that my dear students i'll just let you know a trick with that you can also find the angles between the edges okay so you write a you write b you write c you write alpha you write beta you write gamma so now my dear students how can you find out which angle is which let's say let's say i want to see the 
alpha angle so just put a hand over it right yes you will see that the two edges which are still visible the alpha will be the angle between these two so alpha is the angle between alpha is the angle between b and c so you have b you have c so this angle is known as alpha this angle is your alpha angle okay now let's try to understand this what which angle is beta between a and c so between a and c is your angle beta now let's see this between a and b the angle is gamma so between a and b the angle is gamma okay so this is how you find the angles okay so can i say that can i say that alpha is the angle between b and c angle between b and c beta is the angle between c a and c and gamma is the angle between a and b right yes so my dear students a b c are the edge lengths alpha beta gamma are the angles between them okay these six parameters together give us the complete information about a unit cell these six parameters together give us the complete information about the unit cell so a b c represent the edge length of the unit cell along the three axis the plane may be it is not written here but i'll tell you that the angles actually give the angles between the edges and these in total give you the complete information so these six together are known as the cell parameters okay so you can pause the video you can write it and then we'll move forward okay perfect so the six parameters are a b c alpha beta and gamma for you to understand and have complete knowledge of a unit cell you need to know all the six parameters okay geometry of the unit cell defines the crystal system which unit cell it is it is a cube it is a cuboid it is a rhombohedral it is a tetrahedral it is a triclinic which unit cell it is is given by the geometry of that crystal system there are a total of seven crystal systems now depending on the values of these six parameters there are total my dear students seven crystal systems possible now we'll be understanding which seven crystal systems are these okay so for that you need to write it down and then we'll move forward i hope you've written it now now let's talk about the seven crystal systems and you need to know about each and every unit crystal system my dear students it is very important questions are asked from these so you need to remember these the first is cubic the second is tetragonal third is orthorhombic rhombohedral hexagonal monoclinic and triclinic you have been given their informations as well if this table is not visible don't worry just open your ncrt you'll get exactly the same table and you need to remember this table okay you can remember it as c to that is chief technical officer cubic tetragonal and orthorhombic rhombo then you will have rhombohedral rhombohedral everyone knows if you know about rhombo rhombus you can be you can find the information about rhombohedral then you have hexagonal monoclinic and the triclinic okay so these are a few uh, crystal systems which you need to have complete information their angles their edge lengths everything is very important my dear students so you need to remember each and every thing okay so if you want you can pause the video and draw these but if you can't then write from the ncrt you can understand this particular part i hope you've written it now let's move forward okay now now my dear students i hope all of you can understand that uh, there are four different types of arrangement now see i told you that there are uh, seven different types of crystal systems it could be any type depending on the cell parameters okay now my dear students 
how you will arrange atoms into them that is also a very major role to play right yes let's take an example of cube i'll make you ex explain the uh, all the arrangements with the cubic system only and then you can incorporate them in the other crystal systems as well one by one we'll be discussing about that okay so there can be four types of arrangements for a given geometry of the unit cell for a given crystal system you have seven different crystal systems and you can have different types of arrangements in that that is let's say you have a house and you have people coming over to your house okay you have guests coming over obviously you'll have to decide that which guest will stay in which room that is what you will be doing the arrangement right yes so same way my dear students atoms are guests and they come and uh, stay in the crystal system so crystal system can arrange those atoms in different ways and those arrangements are majorly of four types now you have seven different types of houses and you have four different types of arrangements so this is how you can arrange the people so now let's take one unit crystal system let's take cubic crystal system and understand the arrangements okay so i'll be taking cubic crystal system we will only discuss cubic crystal system okay Now let's take examples of each and every crystal system. Let's say the first arrangement. Your first arrangement is your primitive arrangement. Primitive arrangement is the most basic type of arrangement. And in this arrangement, my dear students, nobody took, uh, took a lot of effort. They just said that atoms will come and they'll sit on the corners of the crystal system. You have a cubic crystal system and in primitive, only and only corners could be, uh, atoms can only take the places of the corners. Okay, so can I say, that one atom will sit here the other atom can sit here the other atom can sit here the other atom can sit here 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 no not here it is not a corner here it is a corner here it is a corner and it is also a corner so basically my dear students eight corners can be occupied by the atoms and this is the primitive arrangement so in primitive arrangement all the corner atoms are occupied and that is known as the primitive arrangement okay and in cubic crystal system we call it as cu primitive cubic crystal system okay or uh, you can say that primitive cubic system so now here my dear students whenever you name something like this this actually the first word actually gives you the arrangement type of arrangement it is primitive okay so type of arrangement is primitive and your cubic system gives you the type of system type of crystal system okay perfect so this is the primitive cubic system okay now let's move forward the next type is you can see when the constituent particles are present at the corners only it is known as the primitive arrangement okay let's talk about the other arrangement the other arrangement is body centered arrangement so in body centered arrangement my dear students the primitive is fixed that can sorry that can happen but now you can place a atom at the body center as well okay so the difference is that atoms will be present at corners atoms will be present at corners but they have one more place to sit and that place is my dear students center of the body so this is the center of the body and in a body centered arrangement atom can sit in the center as well and corners will definitely be occupied so this type of system is known as body centered cubic system okay so here my dear students body centered gives you the arrangement type of arrangement and your cubic gives you the crystal system 
which crystal system you are using. You can you can write here your rhombohedral as well. Then in rhombohedral, all the corners will be occupied and the center of that rhombohedral will be uh, occupied and you will say body centered rhombohedral. So this is how you can use the different type of arrangements in the different crystal systems. So when the constituents particles are present at the corners as well as the center of the unit cell, it is called the body centered arrangement. Okay. I hope you are clear with this. Pause the video. You can write it and then we will move forward. Forward. Let's move forward. Next, face centered arrangement. In face centered arrangement, my dear students, your atoms are still present at the corners. They can be present at corners. Okay. Other than corners, they can be present at the center of all the faces. You have six faces. They can be present on the center of each face. That means that just consider the walls, the walls center. You have six walls in a cube and all the center parts can be occupied. So this is the face centered arrangement. So you call it as face centered cubic crystal system. Okay. So this is your arrangement. This is your arrangement and this is your crystal system. Okay, perfect. I hope you are clear with this. This is how you will be writing the face centered cubic crystal system. Okay. So, it is written when the constituent particles are present at the corners as well as the center of the faces, it is called the face centered arrangement. Okay. Let's discuss about the last type of arrangement and that last type of arrangement is end centered arrangement. What happens in an end centered arrangement is you have atoms present at the corners. And you have atoms present at any one opposite faces, any one pair of opposite faces. This means that let's take this, these opposite faces, then only on these opposite faces uh, the atoms could be present or just erase this. And these, these opposite facing faces, centers, your atoms could be present. Any one pair of oppositely face, uh, opposite facing faces, center atom can be arranged. Okay. Just make a sentence out of it. Okay. I hope you are clear with this. Now you can draw this and uh, this would be known as end centered cubic crystal system. Okay. So this will be your this will be your arrangement and this will be your crystal system. Okay, I hope you are clear with this. These are the four different types of arrangements that are possible and you have seven different crystal systems. It is written here as well. When the constituent particles are present at the corners as well as the center of any two opposite faces, it is called the end centered arrangement. Okay, first write it down and then we'll move forward. I hope you've written it now my dear students just see now you know that there are four types of arrangements and these four type of arrangements can be present in any one of the crystal system right yes you have seven crystal systems and you have four different types of arrangements so can I say that seven into four total 28 unit cells 28 different unit cells can be present yes ma'am you can say that and that is what is actually calculated theoretically that these four arrangements can be present in each of the crystal system. So, total 28 different unit cells can be present in this whole world, right? And these are known as Breves lattices and these are known as Breves lattices. The name is given as Breves lattices. Since four arrangements are possible with uh, each crystal system. So, 7 into 4 that is 28 unit cells are possible theoretically. These unit cells are not equally distributed among the crystal system. Let me tell you these are known as Breves lattices. These are known as Breves 
lattices. Now, since 28 unit cells are too much to handle, what actually happens is our world actually loves symmetry. So, all the 28 crystal systems are not available in the world. They are not possible. They are not uh, present or we could not find them. We could only say that only out of these 28, 14 of the unit crystal systems are present because of the symmetry. Because these 14 have symmetry, the others do not have symmetry and the, our universe loves symmetry. Okay. So, only 14 out of these 28 unit crystal systems exist in nature. Sy System, uh, symmetry is in consideration. These unit cells are not equally distributed. We will see which of the following are possible and you have to learn that as well. Okay. Yes. Pause the video, write it and then we will move forward. These are the crystal systems that are possible. For example, let's say cubic crystal system. In cubic crystal system, my dear students, only three type of arrangements are possible. The end centered arrangement is not seen. Okay. If you talk about the tetragonal, only two type of arrangements are uh, possible. The others are due to symmetry. They are not possible. In orthorhombic, it is one and the only which has all four types of arrangements and that is the reason it becomes an important part because the question is generally asked that which of the following is possible? Which of the following has all the four types of arrangement? It's only one and that is your orthorhombic. Okay, so you need to remember that which of the following arrangement is possible in which crystal system. Just remember that all the primitive is available in all. Orthorhombic has all the four. So, you might have learnt these are 7, 8, 9, 10. 10 you have learnt. Okay. Cubic crystal system you will study so much in this particular chapter that you will remember that only these two more are available. So, you just need to remember this and this. Rest all you know. Rest all you have learnt just right now. Okay. So, just remember this. Generally, question is asked and most of the times, orthorhombic question is asked that which is the crystal system where all the four types of arrangements are possible. It's orthorhombic. I hope you are clear with this. Perfect, my dear students. You can pause the video, write the, draw the diagrams and then we'll move forward. Okay. So, here are the diagrams of the unit cells if you want. Okay, these are the beautiful diagrams of the crystal systems. If you want, you can just go through them. They are just for your uh, knowledge. Um, generally, it is not, uh, uh, you are not asked to draw the diagrams, but yes, you need to know the alpha, beta, uh, alpha, a, b, c and alpha, beta, gamma values that I told you. Okay. Now, let's try to solve a few questions and have a grip on what we have studied. Today, okay. The first question says that the most unsymmetrical and the most symmetrical system are respectively. You have to tell which is the most unsymmetrical and which of the following is the most symmetric of the following. My dear students, the most symmetric is cubic crystal system because it has A equal to B equal to C and alpha equal to beta equal to gamma equal to 90 degree, okay. And your triclinic is one which is the most unsymmetric because in triclinic your A is not equal to B is not equal to C and alpha is not equal to beta is not equal to gamma. Okay, this is something very important for you. This is your triclinic, the most unsymmetric and this is your cubic, the most symmetric. Okay, remember these two, generally question is asked from these two. Okay, perfect. Let's move forward. Next Next says that in primitive cubic unit system, the atoms are present at, it is primitive, it is old. It only says that go and sit on the corners. So, only corner atoms. Okay. Yes, corners of the unit cell. So, option A will be your correct answer. Perfect. Yes, let's move forward to the next. Next is, in the body centered unit cell, the lattice points are present at the primitive, that is corner part as well and the center of the atom, body, crystal system. So, Corner and the center of unit cell. So, option B will be your correct answer. Okay. Perfect. Let's move forward to the next question. Last question for today's session. In the face centered unit cell, the lattice present are corners and all the faces centers. Right? Yes. So, corner and the face centers of the unit cell. So, option C will be your correct answer. Perfect. 
with this let's end our session today we have studied a lot of things today today's topic was a little theoretical so you need to go through all the part you need to read the ncrt i am focusing again and again for this particular part only after this i'll not uh, ask you to read the ncrt but for the theoretical part please go through the uh, uh, NCRT. Uh, you need to remember all the crystal systems, their cell parameters and in which uh, which of the following arrangements are possible. These are a few questions which are mostly asked and you have to answer them. Okay. Yes, I hope you will uh, you enjoy today's session. You learnt a few things and uh, you will definitely do what I have asked you to do. You will solve the DPP as well. We will meet in the next lecture. All the very best. Thank you so much.